Hey, everyone, if you love Kyokushin Karate, combat sports, MMA, boxing, kickboxing, you name it, make sure to hit the like, share, subscribe button to the Drew Spirian Show. 80% combat sports, 20% everything else on all platforms. Today's guest, wow, this is a big one. I want to thank uh, Sensei Darren Stringer and Wesley Jensen for connecting us. Uh, he is one of the UK's best to ever do it with Sensei Darren Stringer. I like to call them Sensei Darren Squared now because now we know each other. He is the one, the only, Darren, the hitman, Chan. Welcome to the Drew Spiri and Sensei Darren. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on, mate. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's an honor, man. It's like when I heard about you and I was saw your stuff and then just like some of the stories I heard about how like you used to just go in there and put people out in both karate, boxing, and kickboxing. I said, okay, I need to get this guy on. Uh, that's, that's really sweet. And, you know, and, and like you said, you know, thank you to you. Thank you to Darren and Wes for, uh, for helping set this up. It's, uh, it's really nice. I've said, like I said to you earlier, I've seen your stuff a lot. And uh, yeah, some, and, and like I said, I was even watching Nicholas Petas and yourself last night. So it's, uh, it's interesting stuff. So it's, it's, it's a real honor for me to be on. It is, yeah, he listen. Anytime I get to get a guest on, it's the show doesn't happen without them. And I think that the most important thing is you really have to be passionate and have that fire to to like make people want to come on. Because if you just talk like this, like yeah, I had Darren the Hitman, Chan, no one's gonna want to watch that. You want to, <laughs> you gotta have that fire. So that's like, so that's where like, even though you know sometimes like when I we used to think it was being bad to be on the autism spectrum, the people used to be like you and whatnot. No, you gotta embrace that. You gotta embrace your flaws. Yeah, you gotta use it to your advantage. 100% use it to your advantage, exactly that. exactly that. Well, I've had loads of coffee, so I'm, I'm good to talk and talk and talk. So. <laughs> Me too, I'm on my third cup. Fueled by coffee. Coffee is fuel. Like, I'm, I guzzle that. I guzzle coffee like it's an SUV. Yeah, I, I drink too much, though. I'm, I'm literally a coffee whore. I need to sort myself <laughs> out. Um, <laughs> nice. Really bad, really bad. Oh, it's crazy. It's, it's, I know. It's, and then, like, when you, after you drink so much, like your head hurts, and then you're like, you need to get water. And, well, no, you know, it's, you know, it's bad when, <clears throat> when you don't do it and your head's pounding and you need it. And uh, yeah, so you've got a coffee machine at work, you've got a coffee machine here. <clears throat> I've got a drive through coffee, Costco, <laughs> work between the two. So I'm just being a bitch with the coffee wherever I'm at. And, and I'm telling people, training people, you must eat this, you must drink that. You know, water, and you know, I've got the water here, but I've, I've equally got copious amounts of coffee, and it's just coffee, coffee, coffee. In fact, what again, what's really sad is my clients will turn up now with coffee for me because they know that I need a coffee, so it's getting bad. It's getting bad. Um, awesome. yeah, so there we go. <laughs> so, I always like to start the show off with uh. You, you know, you have such an extensive martial arts background, but how did you get started in martial arts and what were your, and who or what were your influences? Um, it was, it, it was my um, dad, my father took me to, to my first karate session. Um, my granddad uh, and mom, they, my granddad was in boxing, was a boxer in the army, was a, was a very big boxer. He ran a boxing club. As a younger man, and it was definitely the family thing was to box, you know, my uncle and things like that, you know, was was, was in boxing. But my mum thought that might be quite violent and and not box. Um, her little angel shouldn't be in a boxing ring. So uh my in, in actual fact, my dad, um my mother and father took me to a judo club and they signed me up to a judo club. I was about six. They signed me up to a judo club, and I was due to start that in the in the new year's like a December. I was due to start it in the in the January. And my dad said, oh, there's a karate club at the end of the road. And I just want to try that. Let's just, why don't we have a look at that? I was like, yeah, let's go, let's go. It's fine. Six years old, I'm going to do whatever my dad says. So went down there. And all they did for the whole hour was play games. I was like, dad, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. I want to do, I want to do this. So I don't want to do that judo, throwing stuff. I want, I want, to, I want to play games. <laughs> so it was never about martial arts. It was, they, were, they had a little sponge ball and they were, they were, they were playing football and stuff. Um, and little did I know... Um, obviously, I, you know, it, it became apparent quite quickly. But the the association that that was then and is now is it was Jutsu Karate Kai, which back in the day, back in the seventies, there was a big dude uh, within the BKK ranks uh, by the name of Bernard Creighton, Kai Chai Bernard Creighton, as he goes by the name now. And he's a, he was a big deal um, and won a hell of a lot um, and was one of the big guns, you know, with a, with a Jeff Wybrow, Bernard. Um, and um, he decided that he needed to follow his own star. And, you know, he, as he says, his star was rising and he maybe didn't like 
things the way they were that they were going. So he decided to to to, to adopt his own style and do his own thing. With obviously the Kyokushin um, ideology and with his slant on it as well. So he uh, he formed Jitsukaya, and that happened to be the club in the my road. Um, he he grew up where I grew up, and um, in fact my mum went to the same school as him and stuff like that. So there was a big his karate was quite big in that area. Um, so as years went on, mum didn't want me to get into boxing. As years went on, obviously knockdown was was bread and butter to that association as it was as it is with Kyokushin. So I ended up into knockdown and, and 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 going that way. So that's that's how it started. That was the catalyst. It was playing games. Uh, well, that's it with that karate session. As far as influences are concerned, um, when I was growing up um, in in that style, it was obviously Bernard Creighton. You know, you did just to if you watch highlight reels of the man and then you, you see him the way you know he he kicks and his flexibility stuff, it was always very very jaw dropping. But the my then instructor um, by the, the name of Rick McElroy, he's Shian now, Shian Rick McElroy, he was very much of the same cut from the same cloth. I mean, you know, flexible, hard as nails, kick and punch, drive a nice car, had uh, a different girlfriend every week. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he was kind of like a bit of a hero. So you had him as my main instructor and then Bernard Creighton as my chief instructor. So they were, they were my heroes. And I think as time's gone on and as you evolve as a person, as a man, you, your, your, your heroes change, perhaps uh, your influences change. So they were definitely an inspiration and, and, and the big heroes when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. they will always remain that and stay like that. But then as time goes on, you know, I met, you know, I'd go to the knockdown with my dad every year and I'd see Felix Tomaza fight and I'd see Michael Thompson. And Michael Thompson beat my instructor. And I was like, wow, okay, that's the man that should beat the man. Who's that guy? Whoa, the Black you know, Panther like, beat your instructor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're in the final of the British in 89. And uh, yeah, the Black Panther got his, got his way. It was, you know, it was a great fight to begin with. You know, it was, uh, they both moved really well. Um, and then, you know, Michael, uh, Michael actually low kicked him and then was able to switch it into a Joe Dan Walsh and compound fractured Rick's nose. Um, so it, it was a, it was a, it was a great, great fight. And um, in terms of like, they like a chess match trying to, trying to catch each other out and then Michael edged it and, and, and got him. Um, but then I remember thinking, oh, oh okay, who's Michael Thompson? And then as I was growing up through the nineties, K1 became, became really big. Mm -hmm. Um so then you're looking at people like Andy Hug, you're looking at people like Michael Thompson, you know, and you're looking at karate guys that are like switching over and then giving, you know, the, the, the big tie boxers and kickboxers a, a real run, not just a run for them, but we're beating them as well. Um, and so K1 in the, in the 90s was, was big as it is now, but, the, you know, there was only the, the heavyweights then and they were, they were doing their thing. And it... it Although I carried on training with Rick and you know Bernard, they they kind of split as well. But um, my my idea started to change, but also my direction started to change myself. Maybe you'd say my style was rising in a different way as well. And I started to think, okay, I want to go and train here. I want to go and do that. I want to go do this. And I then met in the mid in the mid to late nineties. Um, I met Felix, and I started working with him. Well, we were doing security together, so we started chatting. And I said, oh, you know, I've always wanted to train with you and Michael Thompson. He said, oh, well, funny you should say that. Uh, he's my best friend. Do you fancy training tomorrow? Well, this was like a Saturday night at a nightclub. And I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, we do this, we do this uh, session in the morning. Um, it's just down the road from Crystal Palace uh, gym. Uh, do, do you want to come down and do some fight training? I was like, yeah. So I drive away that night thinking, what have I just done? I just said, yeah, to go and spar with Felix and Michael. Why have I done that? Um, and I remember, I remember sitting in the, in the gym early, waiting for them to turn up, nervous. And I remember Michael walking in first. And I was like that, like that guy, a starstruck kid, just going, not being able to talk. And he goes, oh, I heard about you, oh, you know, you want to train and like that. And what happened was um, we, we trained. And I was, again, in awe of my, just watching Michael do his thing and Felix and Michael was trained Felix and vice versa. One was doing K1, one was doing obviously the knockdown. And they, they said, oh, we'll do some sparring. And I'm like, okay. I said, oh, you wanna, oh, I don't need to be sparring with you guys because A, I was, I think back then I was about 65 kilos. 
And I said, MB, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to do anything to you guys. No, no, no. Anyway, I was quite unpredictable when I kicked, when I with my legs and stuff. And Michael said, look, do you want to come back? And I was I okay, if you want me to. And he said, yeah. He said, you're, I like that unpredictability of your legs. Now, having that compliment come from him, I could die that day. I could die a happy man. He said, I like the unpredictability of your legs. I mean, this is the dude that beat my instructor with his unpredictability of his legs. And he said that to me, and I was like, okay. He said, look, I want you to come and train um, because I, that keeps me on my toes. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we could swap ideas. And that was it. I trained with Felix and Michael for years. Um, Not only that, he also went to a draw with Matsui, which is like, and some say in Europe, he won that fight, but you know how the judging yeah. is in Japan. Yeah, another extension, another extension, another extension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, uh, um, he, he, yeah, he was the man. He was the man. He was um, tough to train, tough to train with him. But I think back then, it didn't come in. It's weird. Any, any, you know, any. Uh, again, I was listening to your your thing last night with Nicholas Petas, and you said about the training in the Fombo being disgusting. It's really weird because when you are doing that training. You, you just love it. You just, it's hard and it's hurt, but you just love it and you just want to carry on and you want to do it more. And you think, and you, I think you're, you're one of two types of people. You walk out either going, I don't want to do that ever again. Or you walk out going, I want more. And I was luckily that kid that wanted more. And, you know, I, I, I hadn't, I'd done a bit of weights and stuff with my old instructor, but Michael and Felix were, it was the first sort of time where we go, right, we'll, we'll come in, we'll do fight training for about an hour, hour and a half upstairs. Right, cool. Then we'll just towel off, go downstairs and we'll start doing weights for about another hour. Right. And then we'll go for lunch, then we'll come back and wait, do weights again. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to die. Um, and obviously training with these guys for a long period of time, you, you start to become physically and mentally different. You start to pick up. You know, I, I, I was... I, the way I... Could dance around the mat and then and kick because I wasn't ever the strongest upper body wise of fighters. That's why I tried to knock people out quite quick because I think mm, a it's the fastest knockout. Well, I'd like that. I like those. But then also I was never really quite strong with my upper body, so I I struggle a little bit with the with the heavier weights when I went to middleweight. So by trying to dance a little bit and, and do stuff, it, it really helped me. And Michael and Felix were the kings of that. They were the kings of that. And then there was an another guy at the time that I'd seen at the Britishes coming through the ranks. Um, and I think by the time I came into the fold, he was knocking everyone out. And he was like the next, someone, I mean, when you look at him, he was, he was like the next Michael Thompson. He was Kenny Jarvis. Um, and he's the, he's the great Britain coach now for, for the BKK. So I'd seen this guy. And it was funny because we kept missing each other in training. So he'd train with Michael one day and then the next day, he'd be there and we'd missed each other for about four or five months i heard about him he heard about me i'd seen him but he hadn't seen me and um there came a day where um we went to i was in the bkk and i was training and i, and I had a chance to spar with kenny but why right, i've been training with michael i've been training with felix i know what would be a really good idea and you do stupid things like this when you're young i'll i'll try and put it on kenny because i want him to have a bit of respect for me but i want to see how good i am so I'll put it on Kenny. Anyway, I came off worse and he broke my nose. He kicked me across the face and broke my nose. But he did it in a way where I'd never seen this kick before. I didn't, I didn't know what he'd done. And I saw a bit of a flash. And the next thing, my nose was everywhere and he broke my nose. And um, I walked over to my, uh, who became my instructor, Noddy, Shian Noddy, Graham Warden. I've still got a bit of paper he wrote on. So if I'm going on now, I've had too much coffee. But... I walked over to him like this and I said, um, I'd like to come to your club, please. Could you give me the details? And I'm literally just pissing. Wow. Up. Can I have your details? So he's written the, the, the address on a bit of paper and I've still got that in a box upstairs with all the blood all over it. I was like, okay, <laughs> Tuesday. And he said, I think you better go and get your nose sorted out, son. I said, yeah, I'll do that, but I'll be there Tuesday. And then I, when I walked past Kenny, I said, oh, thanks. I said, um, see you Tuesday. And because in my head, I just... I just love, I love fighting. I just love fighting. And so, yeah, I'd broken my nose. And I turned up on the Tuesday and then got another shoe in by Kenny on the Tuesday. And that club was very renowned for being one of the most brutal clubs in Britain, really. In over the years, for the 70s, the 80s, 90s, 
it was it was renowned for being one of the most brutal clubs. And the, the, the guy at the helm of it, Noddy, he was a very, very brutal fighter himself. You go back through the through through time and look at some of his fights. Those guys from coming out of Bethany Green, they were brutal, they were brutal. And I think in a combination with Felix and Michael, and then you know, being with, with that club with Kenny Jarvis and those, those fighters there and that mentality. That's what took me to world level. But that's where the next inspiration came. So I still trained with Michael and Felix and mm. Kenny. Being with Kenny, this is a world-class fighter that's beating you up. And I mean, he was beat. I remember him coming in the club one day saying, it'd be a really good idea if we just don't wear shin pads anymore. <laughs> right? And that was it. Shin pads went out the window. And we just used to beat the hell out of each other. And we used to have visitors from Japan and Russia and loads turning up. In fact, there was one guy, I can't remember his name. He was a famous Russian fighter that turned up. Can't remember his name, about seven foot tall. And we were trying to knock him out. And he was trying to, and he was a heavyweight, he was trying to knock us out as well. And that was the brutality of the club. But again, being with Kenny, he fought in the Sabaki in the States. And I just said, I want to come with you. So I'd pay to follow him around and train with him um, and go to Ninamir's tournament in, in Colorado and train with him with the Uchi Deshis there and just follow Kenny. Kenny, just follow Kenny around and just train with him and nick his ideas. and in the end, it, that came full circle and I was able to, to go out mm -hmm. on the market and start doing what Kenny was showing me, what Felix was showing me, what, what um, Noddy was showing me, what uh, Mike was showing me. But the, the foundation and the, and the, and the basics, the, fa the basic foundation to work off of was from Bernard and Rick. So in answer to your question, I know long-winded, that, that's kind of like the inspiration, inspirations of, mm -hmm. of in the K1 for me. Um, of how that all, how I became me. And I think the whole knockout thing, going out there and just trying to knock people out, not 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 being pretty about it, but just trying to knock people out was the Nigel Ben thing. That's that's a big he was a big inspiration for me growing up with Tyson. Mm -hmm. Their their ideology, their 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 ethos, they're just going no nonsense, just go and knock people out. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted as well. I wanted to be that guy. That's uh, amazing. So you know, in a respectful way, mm -hmm. in a, in a, a Budo-like way, but I wanted to fight. I had a bit of an axe to grind. I had a, had, a bit, I had a few anger issues and I just wanted to fight and I wanted to knock people out. And I think, I think that's, that can be missing a little bit in fighting today where people just try and nick, nick the, the win. You know, try and knock the person out. Try and drop the person. It's all knock down, knock them out, knock them down. You know, uh, you know, I know that you can't always do that. You've got two good fighters and you can't always do that. Or you've got a strong fight, you can't do that. But try, try and knock them out. Try and try and be a pleaser. So uh, people want to see you. Exactly. That, that was what I wanted to be like anyway. So. Amazing. So during this time, you know, now you've, uh, now you're on Team Felix. And describe to me when you first met a young Darren Stringer and how you guys were coming up the ranks together, like two, uh, Ace pilots like Maverick and Goose. Describe that that period. Uh, yeah, which one's Maverick? Was which was Goose? <laughs> uh, yeah, Darren Stringer. Okay, so um, I was at Bethnal Green. Well, I was at, I was actually at Crystal Palace to begin with with Felix. Um, that, that changed, although I carried on training with Felix right the way through to near enough my in the end of my career. But I um, I I was at Bethnal Green. And Darren was, I think Darren was about four years younger than me. There was a, a young, young whippersnapper by the name of Darren coming through the ranks. Um, and where I'd, I'd probably, ha I'd probably had, I think it's fair to say, I'd probably had a few tournaments. Because um, I'd come from another style. I had no novice. Back. I had no mm -hmm. novice. had to do novice. I had to go straight into the mainstream fight thing. Whereas Darren, where he was coming through the BKK, was allowed to do novices. So what was happening? Um, ultimately, I'd fight in say the the British knockdown at Crystal Palace in mainstream, and Darren would be in the novices and be the new young gun knocking everyone out in the novices. And I remember uh, Crystal Palace. He 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 won't know this. He'll remember. He'll remember the time. I think it was ninety nine, two thousand, around about that time, two thousand, maybe. Yeah, he won the novice British six foot trophy and I remember looking at the, him on a the podium then going that's the guy that's the guy I'm going to have to be because he's like becoming the, the BKK darling mm -hmm. and he was technically flary with his kicks and could knock people out and 
I remember thinking, I remember feeling nervous. And I can say that now because now we're not fighting anymore. I can say that. But I remember feeling nervous. I remember thinking, shit, man, this kid could knock me out. Damn. Um, and I remember thinking, I've got, I've got, I've got to knock him out. I've got to beat him. And he was, he could really, what I loved about his fighting style and ability was he was a real th thinking fighter. Um, and he could just take people apart. And he had a game plan as well. So he'd take people apart but wanted to knock them out. And he'd technically take them apart and then knock them out. Whereas I would do that, but I was, I was wanting to get the knockout sometimes before he'd take, take them technically apart. Whereas he would strategically do that. I remember thinking, shit. So what would happen is we would then turn up at squad training sessions and there was like that rivalry between us. And we'd sort of be like that. And then he, um, I saw him at a, a, a summer camp and we both were staring at each other. And now he's probably thinking the same with me and I'm thinking that of him. And uh, we were like, okay, this is gonna, this is gonna happen. And like, we go in training sessions again at summer camp or squad training, and he'd be doing his thing, and he'd be smashing pads and like hitting people, and I'd be doing it as well. And again, it was like that stare at hundred places at each other. And um, but again, it was always, I think, back then I would never admit I was, I was scared of him. Not scared, I was ner I was nervous of him because he could knock people out. Um, you know, and I, and I thought, okay. But then I, equally as well, I, I put pressure on myself because I wanted to, I wanted to be that guy. I, I, I was that guy to a degree where I could knock people out. But I wanted to be the best. He wanted to be the best. So it's interesting. And, you know, they say that um, when I think back to it now, every, every great uh, rivalry, that, that, that you know, rivalry with people, they complemented each other. So my hero is Nigel Benn. He had Chris Eubank. And I'm by no means saying we are a Chris Eubank and Nigel Benn before I get shut down by people. But what I'm saying is to have that rivalry, to have that person as a catalyst is the best thing. Because he actually made me train harder. He made me want to fight harder. Because I used to look at him thinking, he'd be in the gym, and he's one dedicated motherfucker. He, he, when people were asleep, that fucker would be in the dojo. He's got a dojo in his garden. He'll be training. He'll be training. So that used to get me up in the morning running. That used to make me think, shit, I've got, I've got to be on this. Because if I miss a day in training, that fucker won't. If I miss, if I have a day off, he won't. So in actual fact, I've got a lot to thank him for because he pushed me without even realising it. And I'm sure I, maybe I did the same. I don't know. But he, uh, yeah, he pushed me. But we became, uh, we became great friends uh, over the years. And um, as I said, you know, earlier, we used to go out loads. Like, you know, he, my girlfriend at the time used to come stay there. Uh, I think he, still, he was still living at his parents at the time. So he used to come stay with me and we'd train, we'd go out drinking. And so the, the rivalry changed. Um, and what helped as well is I slipped up to middleweight. So he was always a lot. In fact, the fuck is still a lot right now. But I, I, I went up to middleweight. So that, that changed for us. My, my, he wasn't, he, for years, he was the catalyst for me thinking, shit, you know, not only have I got to contend with the people around the world, I've got to contend with the dude in my backyard. I've got to contend with this dude. Every time I go to squad train, every time I go to a local tournament, that fucker's the one there. So I've got to, I've got to deal with that. Um, and that's, that's, you know, he's a world-class fighter. So, you know, this is, this is going to be hard. Um, but then when I slipped up to middleweight, the, the emphasis changed on who, who you're looking at and who, who are your, your, your competitive sort of opponents, you know, abroad and in England as well. Um, so, but he'd do this thing now and again where he'd flip up to middleweight as well. Um, so he was always there. He was always there in, in the background. But like I said, we became great friends. And uh, we had, we've, we've travelled the world together. So we've, had, we've got great memories and, and, and good laughs and, and, and that we've had over the years. So it's uh, definitely uh, a strong bond that was formed. Um, I, think, I think without going into too much detail as well and without pissing anyone off, I do think as well that sometimes there was tension caused between Darren and I. And we've spoke, him and I have spoken about this often as well, um, where you've got the darling of Kyokushin, of, of Great Britain Kyokushin, you know, he was... Anchi uh, O'Neill's boy, you know, David Pitfall's boy. Um, and I wasn't. I wasn't. I was, to some respect, I was 
was a bit of a black sheep. I'd come from another style, or that was mm-hmm. sheep. I was I was the black sheep. No, the black sheep beating the golden boy, and you know, the, you know, or potentially beating the golden boy. And you can't have, and then you know, we want the golden boy to beat the black sheep. Um, and uh, I think sometimes over the years, maybe there was a, a wedge put between Darren and I um, because of our friendship uh, and because of, um, you know, us going against each other. There's going to be a winner. There's going to be a loser. Isn't there? There's going to be um, a winner and a learner, should I say. There's going to be a winner and a learner. You know, there's, there's, there's going, someone has to win, someone has to lose. And, I, and um, But I think in terms of friendship as well, I think there was a wedge put in then, uh, you know. So that that... We've had a bit of a journey as a, in a friendship kind of way, but it's come full circle. And uh, yeah, he's a good lad. He's a good lad. And I'm glad that he's a friend. And I'm glad that we can sit in now as old men and talk about what we used to do and talk about how we used to do this now. And recently, we've, we've been doing some seminars and stuff together um, with Simeon, I told you about. Yeah. I've been wanting to get him on my show. Simeon is Man, like- you need him on the show. He's a great, great karateka. Just a great person. Um, so if he's watching this, I, you know, I want everyone to know that he's just a, he's a great man. He really is. And, uh, and what a fighter, really good fighter. But, you know, so we've sort of clubbed together and we've been doing some stuff together recently. Um, and it's just, it's just nice. It's just, it's, it's just nice to be around him again. It really is. Cause I've had a bit of a break from it all. Um, and weirdly enough now, um, no, I've, I myself have gone full circle. So I've gone back to Kaicho Bernard Quinton and Jutsu Kai. Um, and now I, I, I know after speaking to him, you know, for a long time, I, I want to help him and the association bring through the new young guns, the new mm-hmm. um, knockdown fighters, maybe K1 fighters. I don't know. So I want to, I want to try and do that now. But that's that's the rivalry with Darren Stringer and I, and that's that's my memory of a young of a young Darren. But listen, this this kid, he when he when he first came on the scene, he was knocking everyone out. He was yeah. uh, like, wow, okay. Um, yeah, he was he was uh he was something special. He still is, still is, still, still do his thing now. So um what would be interesting is uh see him him and I now doing it out there. I wonder what how where the hell we'd fit now. <laughs> so, don't he's 20, that. actually weirdly enough, this year is 20 years. When I say me and him, not me and him fighting, me and him going out, everyone else. Uh weirdly enough, this year is 20 years in November since we did our first world tournament. Um, so the IFK World Tournament in Valencia, in, and it's in Valencia again. So uh, in in June or July, in July I think. Mm-hmm. So twenty years since we both fought in our first World Tournament, and I think we went on. Uh, I think he did a few more than me, but I think I did six or seven. He he, I think he did a few more than me. So yeah. So now to take it, because like you know, so when you were saying just before this, like this gave me the question to ask. You said you were the black sheep. So I would like to say you're more of an anti-hero because, you know, anti-heroes are more real. They're more like, they're not perfect. How did you embrace that role going into your fight? And were there any intense rivalries you had where they, like people, if your opponent looked down on you when you're like, okay, like, I'm, it's like, you know, you might look down on me now, but when we get in that tatami, it's just you and me, no more. Yeah, I, 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 um, I thrived on it. I thrived on it. I uh, fucking loved it. Um, I, I didn't give a shit about being a black sheep. I, I didn't care. And all I wanted to do was fight. And I just wanted my fighting to, to you know, I, when people listen to this, I don't want them to think that I am not of Budo nature and I'm not respectful. I, I am. But I just loved fighting. And I just, and I, you know, I just let my fighting do the talking. Like, okay, you want to speak shit at me? Well, you think that of me? Cool. Get, get out there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and knock you out. And um, and I remember uh, some of the other BKK and IFK people will remember this. This is how much fighting meant to me. Sometimes, as opposed to winning the tournament, um, there was a guy in 2001. We fought in a regional, so we had regional tournaments here, and you have to kind of make a mark in the regional side of things before you can step up. So at squad training, you're told, make a, make a bit of a mark on regional level. And if you can win a regional, you know, you're then progressed up. And that's how you kind of go through the ranks of becoming a, a mainstream fighter for Great Britain. So I remember going into the, I'd, I'd, I think I'd, I'd, won a, I'd won a regional when I placed in two or three and was in this next one. So I'd kind of earned my strides in <laughs> regional. But I'd gone into the middleweights and there was, a, there was a lad that came in and he'd said to me that he was going to 
knock me out in the changing room. He was going to do this, he was going to do that. I was like, okay. And I was knocking quite a few people out at the time. And he, he said, oh, yeah, I'm going to knock you out. I was like, oh, cool. Sweet, let's see you out there then. Anyway, I got him in the, I got him in the first round. I was like, oh, there we go. So his Hanchi was refereeing it. <laughs> and so he's come out. He's punched me square in the face. So I punched him straight back in the face. So he's then retaliated and punched me in the face. So, I, so there we are on the time, punching the hell out of each other in the head. So Hanchi stopped it and warned us. And your mate, we just carried on punching each other in the face. And I thought to myself, he, he, I thought, oh, I'll do it first because I know he's going to do it again. And he was trying to sort of stamp his authority on me and just let me know that I was his bitch. I thought, well, I'm not having that. So I did it back. And anyway, this carried on to the point where Hanchi stopped it and both then disqualified us both. <laughs> and I think... If I'm not mistaken, that's that record still stands as probably one of the, one of the only fights that both fighters have got disqualified. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, not proud of it, but definitely not Kyokushin like. But my, I I relished in fight in the fight. It's like okay, I'll do it back. You you do that, I'll, I'll do it back. And and this stems back to to Rick McElroy. When I was a kid, no, I can be honest about it. Now I'm very, I'm actually quite insecure, and I'm actually. Weirdly enough, it, you probably wouldn't think it, inherently quite shy. And some people will be sitting there going, shut up. But I am. I'm actually inherently quite shy, but I'm actually quite insecure. And, you know, I used to get bullied as a kid and that sort of thing. And my dad marched me down to Rick at that club that I told you about years ago. And my dad said, look, you know, you need to toughen him up. He comes home every day crying. He gets bashed up. He gets bullied. So he was like, right, leave him with me. So he went on a strange journey where he'd do the same thing to me and just literally verbally like giving it to me and then bashing me in the sessions. And I don't think that'd be allowed today, but he, he did it. It was the reverse psychology thing and it worked because I remember gaining my black belt and, um, and we just come, we went to Denmark to, 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 to do summer camp at Bernard Creighton's summer camp mm-hmm. for my black belt. And I remember thinking I'd won a tournament as well. And I was, they put me in an adult tournament. I'd won that as well. And I was thinking, okay, yeah, won this tournament, black belt. And I was 15. I should never even been in an adult tournament. And I, he beat the shit out of me on the Monday after Denmark. I remember getting really angry. I remember getting really upset and angry. And when, when, when everyone left, he said to me, oh, did, um, did you enjoy the session tonight? I remember, I remember just not waiting to talk to him. I was like, welling up, thinking, oh, I'm getting upset. And he said, look, does anyone bully you now? I went, no, not really. And he said, when people are racist to you and say racist remarks, and they, and said, do you, are you, does it bother you? I said, no, not, not really now. He said, oh, my job's done here then. My, my work's done. I went, what wow. do you mean? He said, he said, I knew that you'd come through. He said, no one does that to you now. And he, 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 our relationship changed after that. And, you know, I'm godfather to his son and things like that. And our relationship changed. And, it, and he... Um, he, he, he toughened me up and he said, you don't stand for any shit. And people, there's karate and that's great, but people are going to, in life, people are going to take the piss. People are going to try to, you know, mentally abuse you. They're going to, they're just going to take the piss. They're going to do this and that. And he was right. You know, there are people out there that are just assholes. You know, and I don't know, and it sounds sad. And, and he said, there are people in karate that are going to, through, through your karate journey, that might try to dictate to you. There are people that are going to try and do this. That, you know. But he said, you are very good at what you do. And he said, let that be your talking point. Let that be what you do. And, and, and you know, and, and go out there and do what you do. Do what you do best. Mm-hmm. And I was always very afraid of fighting. You know, and I, and I, I haven't watched loads of stuff, but I, I, I don't know if many fighters say this, but I actually, although I love doing it, I'm actually quite frightened of it. And um, no one wants to get hurt. So I used to try and knock people out to try and get it done quick because I was actually frightened of getting knocked out and hurt myself. Um, so being the black sheep just fueled that as well, because it, it, it kind of gave you, it kind of, if I just thought if people are thinking I'm a black sheep and I, and they, they don't want to fight me. Great. Cause that means mentally I can try and do a Nigel Ben and a, and a, and a Tyson. And they're scared before they've even got on the map. And I quite like that. Um, but then when they actually get to know me and they go, actually, you know what? We, we had the wrong opinion of you. We actually thought you might be a bit of an arsehole. I'm not an arsehole. I just, I, I just like fighting. I'm just doing that. I'm doing that. So that's kind of what I thought of the black sheep thing. Um, but as I said, Darren was the, I think in every generation you have the darling, don't you? You have the, the, the karate darling in, in any country. Um, 
you know so then he was the the karate darling he was the he was the man he was the white knight and you were the you were the the dark knight as a, yeah like, he was the spider-man i was venom that was that, that that sort of thing that's a good analogy that's a good analogy i'd say you're more like the batman in the sense because batman's very like you know he's not perfect and i guess you know darren must have been probably with superman because you know superman is like always liked and you know no one can you know say superman's bad but yeah. yeah, it was kind of like that. It was kind of like that, and he, he you know, he, um, yeah, it, 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 it was, it was like that. But I always looked at what he did and was again in awe of what he would do as well. Um, but then I remember we we got a massive compliment from um, from uh, Noddy um, again, Graham more than once, where Darren and I would always be asked by Hanchi to say always, but we for about four or five years would be the guys that were called to do the demonstration of the rules for the British knockdown. And the British knockdown is because uh, the palace was, you know, the, the jewel in the crown, or it still is, you know, it's, it's a big tournament for fighters to fight in, and they, they want to fight in there. And it was at the iconic Crystal Palace, kind of like where it all started, you know, back in the day here and that. And we were always asked to do the, the demos. And so where we like to kick and be a bit flary, we'd always sort of take what he asked us to do and then just sort of, like that that's to start spinning kicks and stuff like that um in fact it's a great film best of the best and if you've seen the end scene with uh tommy with his brother his real life brother doing the stuff we kind of copied that a little bit and now we would do some mad stuff on the mat and i remember noddy saying how does it feel to be hanshi's boys and i said oh what do you mean and he said oh if he asks you to do you two to do that that means he really respects you and that means that you're his boys and so that set that set well with us because we saw oh, that's that's a that's a massive compliment that you know he wants you to do that and that's what people are thinking that so um yeah the uh, venom and spider-man would, would get together now and again and do that nice nice so then you know now then you obviously branch out to boxing and then kickboxing so mm -hmm. what did that teach you because you were in karate and then you go into like k1 and what was that experience like um <laughs> I think, uh, you know, there, there, I'd obviously boxed throughout, even the, you know, like I said, there's boxing in the family, and I'd always always boxed as well. Um, but then um, karate came calling, so, I, so it was, that was my main thing. But I love boxing. It was my dad, really, that, that was a massive boxing fan, so I'd sit with my dad watching Tyson fights and, again, like the Nigel Benn fights. He's still, to this day, Nigel Benn's biggest hero. Um, and now his son, is a, both his sons are, are really good. So, but I always kind of felt pulled towards getting in the ring. And um, what I would do between knockdown tournaments and stuff, would I go to like a local Thai boxing club? Um, I was training at a, a boxing club. I'd actually go and train at Fitzroy Lodge um, and, and go there and train and spa and then have a shower and then drive up to Bethnal Green and then go and do karate. Um, but I was always pulled back to the karate doing karate tournaments and I wanted to, I wanted a box, I wanted a box, I wanted a box. Um, so then I had an opportunity to, to, to do it going to K1 and kickboxing and stuff. And I thought, yeah, that's definitely me. And what I found with a karate was you'd have X amount of tournaments a year. And sometimes, sometimes you wanted to be, as a younger guy, um, you wanted to be more active. And I think the more active you are, the better you'll be because you know you're going up against some of these guys like the Russians that have uh, they had their own leagues type thing within Russia and other countries like that where they're fighting on a regular basis on a regular basis. So when you're coming up against that fighter that's been fighting say for six months every other weekend and you've had three tournaments, you're going to be on a back foot, you know. Um, and it's the tournament style of things. So you know you. You can train and spar every day of the week, but when it's tournament day and you need to get into that mentality and that, those nerves and stuff like that. So I decided to supplement my karate. All that came on a boxing was a supplementation to karate. Mm. Okay, so I'd seen this guy down in Kent and he had a, a boxing team, a kickboxing team down there uh, called TKO. And I really liked the way that they, they spent a lot of time on their boxing stuff. And I was like, okay, I can kick. I need to work on my hands and the relationship between doing, doing knockdown and punching and kicking is way different to punching in the head and kicking. So I had to have that crossover. 
was like, right, I need to get my boxing game going as well as the kicking. So I decided to go to his club. So I traveled from here to his club three, four times a week. I was personal training with him, 6 a.m. And this club is not down the road. This club is like an hour and a half drive. So I'd go to his gym at six o'clock on a Saturday morning and have to leave my house at half four in the morning to, to get there. Um, and I spent a year with him and it was a great, it is a great club. He's a great, great coach. And he kind of had the mentality, like Noddy, where it was no nonsense mentality, but his training was quite brutal and I quite like that. Um, the fighting as well, I like that. And he didn't try to change my kicking and say, and try to poo-poo it. He was like, right. He's actually a karate guy himself back in the day. So I, I made that transition to kickboxing and I think I won um, a professional title with him a year later on the IKF middleweight, super middleweight title, which I was proud of. So I thought, wow, you know, I've come from karate and, you know, some people do try and step into the ring and it goes badly. And my idea was always K1. So that was kickboxing above the waist. So I remember sitting down going, look, I respect you. We still talk now. I spoke to him yesterday. And I was like, I respect you. I love you. I want to carry on training with you. But I need to go into K1. And at the time, I was, oh, I still am, I'm very good friends with Kieran Kettle and the Kettle brothers. Um, and they're, they're royalty in the Thai boxing world. Um, and they've done a lot. And I continued to train with Colin, continued to train with Colin all the way through my knockdown stuff as well. Um, but I made the switch to, to, to Sentex gym at the time, Steve Gladstone and Kim Kettle, and decided to go into to K1. For, obviously, it's predominantly Thai, but they do K1 rules. Um, so, you know, now, now we're of a, of a, a then, I changed, it was only heavyweights doing K1. Now that you had the K1 max, you had the lighter weights doing it as well, or K1 rules. So I started to fight in K1 rules with, with that. So what I found really quickly was I was active all the time. I was, if there was no knockdown, there was a K1 fight. If there was no K1, there was a knockdown. So there was always fights. And I think it went another six months, eight months, and I won my first K1 uh, title um, with Steve Gladstone and, and Kieran Kittle. Um, and then continued to, continued to do the, the K1 thing. In, in all honesty, I left it too late to get into to, to it. I think if I, you know, I'm looking at lads now, there's a, there's a gym I go to now and they're fighting for the titles at 2021. And I was doing that in karate. Um, and I'd left the K1 and the kickboxing until I was 29 or 30. So I think if I was to have my time again, I would have gone into it earlier, mm -hmm. supplement it earlier. But it's tough. It's tough. Any fighter will tell you where we do karate or K1 or Thai boxing to, to live a life, work, have a relationship, train at an elite level and fight, some don't get the mix right. Some, I've missed the mix up a lot of times where I'm out with a lady and decide that I'm in love. And maybe that's, that's definitely the way forward now. And then you think, oh, actually, no, it's not. And I need to be training. I need to get my ass in training. Or training, you, you meet a girl and say, oh, do a bit of training. Oh, how many times do you go to the gym? Every day, twice a day. And that's the end of that. It's hard, it's hard to try and get that balance. But I think those that do get that balance, there's a lot of sacrifice. And I'm sure the people that you've had on here would say the same thing. There's a lot of sacrifice, loads of sacrifice. Yeah. To, yeah, like my, yeah, like for example, my Cian Pierre, who's like one of the most accomplished uh, uh, in North America, Pierre Cata, shout out to Cian Pierre, yeah. Cata Ford, amazing friend and mentor. I love that guy. Like, um, so uh, what, uh, what he was, so basically what he, um, what he was telling me is like, when people come to me and say, I want to be a world champion, I'm going to tell them, do you know the sacrifices you're going to have to make? Think of all the money you're going to have to spend yeah. to, uh, to basically become that, to become a champion. And yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. It's, it's not easy. He's like, people, he's like, when I tell them, they're like, okay, maybe I'll become maybe, and if they try to take a shortcut, I tell them, nope. There's no shortcuts. You got to be ready to make those sacrifices. You're going to have to become a no man to your people yeah. around you. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, people have said to me in the past, oh, did you feel like you missed out? Not at all. I actually, I, I was doing what I wanted to do. So I never was, I was never missing out because I was doing the thing I love most. So the fighting and the training, and the, that's the thing, being in the dojo, being in the ring, being on the mat, that's the thing that I love the most. So when you're doing the thing that you love the most, 
going out drinking, going out with a girl, going out with your mates, that, that, that's not the thing you love the most. So I was never, ever, I never, ever felt I was missing out at all. Did my, did my, my position in life, was that, was that on hold slightly? Yeah, to a degree. Friends of mine were buying houses, were going on holidays, were, you know, had, had, I know it's materialistic, but obviously a quality of life was being had by them. Did I, did I not have that to a degree? Yeah, because I wasn't working as many hours as I should have been. It wasn't, I was chopping and changing jobs. No, I was going part-time to train and things. So therefore, financially, I wasn't doing very well. So then if I'm financially not doing well, then my quality of life isn't that of theirs. But I never looked at them being jealous. I just thought, oh, I'll have that one day. Mm-hmm. I've got what I've got to do first. Um, but it was tough. It was tough. I remember going to tournaments. <laughs> I can say it now because I don't work for anyone. I work for myself now, but I can, I can say it. But I, I remember going to tournaments, ringing from other countries to the, to the boss, saying, I'm not well, I can't come in today. Or getting my mum to ring. I'd be in Denmark, or I'd be in. I remember Berlin European Championships. They they weren't allowed. They weren't allowing me to go, and I've been selected. And my mum ringing up every day for me, saying, "Oh, he's still not well. He's still, still not, still not." You know, I've got asthma, so she played the asthma card. Sounds bad, I know, terrible, but she played the asthma. Oh, he's, oh, he's terrible. He can't come into work. I was in Berlin fighting, but because they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me. In actual fact, I got, I got caught out when I came back because um, it was in a magazine. Oh and, no. I left it, left it in the gym. So I got fucked for that one. So I, I was, uh, I was suspended from duty for for that one. Um, so that was uh, that was quite funny. But there's a lot, of, there's a lot of sacrifice that out there. And I think those that those that get to the top in any sport, there's sacrifices that 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 have been made in all aspects of their life, family, friends. And you, you kind of realise who your friends are as well. You know, when you say, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this. Some people get really pissed off of it and they just go, oh, don't worry about it. But other people are like, you know, it's, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and they support, they support the cause. They support the, uh, the, the, end, the end game, don't they? So, you know, it, it's, it, it's a strange time. It's a, lonely, it's a lonely time. But I remember saying to my coach once, I said, um, you probably got it from Samsung, but I said, ah, oh, he said, oh, how are you feeling? I went, yeah, yeah, my mates are doing this. I was young. So, uh, da, da, da. And he said, this is lonely at the top. And I went, yeah, yeah, it is. And he went, but it's overcrowded at the bottom. Oh. Like, hmm, like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know where he got that from. But, yeah, I, I like that. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's true. So, um, it's a strange place, but it's, a nice, it's equally a nice place. You, listen, you when you work hard and then you're... You, you put your life on hold and you're standing on a podium at a world championships or European championships, or you're going to another world championships here, there and everywhere, or Darren and I fought in like the Arctic circle in, you know, you know, in Russia and stuff, you know, when, you, when you're doing stuff like that, you're like, okay, this is, this is why I've worked hard. This is, mm-hmm. this is my rewards. Um, that is fun. It's fun. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. So, um, now that you know you you work for yourself and you you're also getting back, you said life comes full circle. What's the plan yeah. now with uh, what you do? And now that you're back in karate, yeah, I think a few things uh, with karate didn't really sit well with me, and you know I had a bit of a break, had a bit of a break from mm-hmm. it. Um, and without again going, going into too much detail, I. Made a few decisions, thinking oh, I might try this, much like that. And I was, I, I was in a confused place. I was in, I was in a, I was in a real sort of strange headspace where what, what I'm going to do. And then, you know, I wasn't doing it. I was so confused. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't being. I wasn't making any decision. And again, things had really, really hadn't sat well with me. And I, and I sort of kind of buried myself in my work. I work in boxing, so I work. I run a gym that has strength and conditioning. A lot of amateur boxers mm-hmm. also. I've worked for pro boxing teams as well. Um, and I, I still work for a guy, David Hay, who was a very, very you know, famous world champion and stuff like that. And he's a friend of mine. So I, I kind of buried my head in that. And all of a sudden, I got, I got a call up for going around the world with his then trainer as well and, and, and doing stuff with him around the world. So it was kind of easy to just do me and do work and maybe mm. concentrate on me for a little while, uh, me as a person, me as a man, me as a, what, what, am, what am I, who am I without karate? Who am I 
you know, without my slice and maybe do a little bit more soul, soul searching. Um, so I did that for a few years. Uh, again, buried my head in the sand a little bit with the gym and lost myself there. But karate kept pulling me back. And I kept finding myself being pulled back. And I thought, oh, when I joined an association, it really wasn't really going the way I wanted it to go. And I was like, ah, oh, it's not for me. And like, okay, well, that's okay. Anyway, COVID hit. And I had a few injuries. And I started to speak to my old instructor, like Joe Bernard Green, on Facebook and stuff. Anyway, he started to, he does alternative medicine and therapies and stuff like that in Denmark. He's got a clinic in Denmark next to his dojo. And he started to help me with stuff for my injury and he'd be on the phone every day and I remember sitting there one day through COVID thinking overthinking stuff as you do when you're sitting there in lockdown with nothing to do thinking this is a dude that's just helping me for no no ulterior mode just helping me so we started to chat we started to talk about cry and then it came onto the subject of maybe me doing cry back with him and um, I sat and thought about it and thought, you know, I want to make a decision where I stick to it. I want to make a decision where once I go there, that's it. You know, and it needs to feel right as well. Um, and no decision was made. We just carried on talking, just carried on training. And then one day we had this mad conversation for about two hours. And I was like, okay, this is where I want to be now. This is what I want to do. And so the plan now is I'm back in his association. He's, he's based in Denmark. So he has instructors over here. Um, I think at the time, I, I, right now, as for any club, any business or anything, everything's just right, just trying to get everything back, back after this shit with COVID and stuff. So just get everything everything going on with, with, with what, you know, the clubs and stuff. But he's, you know, like I said, he, he's, he's achieved a lot in his career, um, you know, both uh, professionally as, a, as his, in his clinic and stuff, but also on a knockdown mat and things. He's very well respected and he runs the WIBK. Um, and he kind of like, he's like, you know, he, he respects what I've done and what I've achieved, and which is really nice, which is another big compliment as well. He's like, look, you know, you are doing stuff which is for the greater good of the association. So he's kind of, he doesn't give me a free ticket to do what I want, but he knows that I'm not going to try and do something bad, if so. I mean, I'm, I'm only ever going to do something that's good for the association. So, the idea now is to try and build, help him build knockdown ranks, help him build clubs. Uh, there's not really as many clubs in the London area now. So my old instructor, Rick, I've made him, I've got him uh, involved. He's coming back as well. Mm -hmm. So in an association side of things, in terms of Jitsu Kai, is to help build that brand, help build that, help try and give back to like how I was. I want to open a club back in Catron where I was, brought up where he was brought up where I first started right so that's that side of things then there's the Dan Stringer Simeon side of things I'd also uh, add Sammy from one Kyokushin who Sammy uh, Sammy yeah as well yeah, yeah I, Sam you know what, I've known, known him for years through social media but not ever met him mm -hmm. and then I met uh, uh, Simeon's dojo he's a lovely guy he's a really lovely guy I've uh, got a lot of time for him and you know he has shared the love uh, with me on his page loads so you think oh that's really sweet because again became the black sheep a little bit and and he was just like no this is i'm putting this up so that, that was that was really sweet um now he's a lovely guy yeah so these guys are kind of clubbing together and they just want to do cry they just want to train and they want to do cry and i'm like okay and what is lovely what is lovely is i wear uh uh calligraphy now this mm -hmm. cry they don't care you know i don't care that they wear kyokushin it's the karate cut we are doing karate. We are, you know, it's the Budo spirit. We just want to train. So we're speaking now about training sessions, squad training sessions. I have a gym that has a strength conditioning section that's going to have, there's a boxing gym downstairs. Darren's going to come in with these fighters. You know, we've then got fighters from Simeon's club that's they're saying, look, we want to try and get together and try and sort something out. So we're going to sit down and we're going to try and sort that out. Now, that's going to act uh, as a catalyst for, the Jutsu Kai guys haven't, some of them haven't got that much experience. There were a few fighters that fought the other day. They can get involved with that because there's some world-class fighters that are going to come through and start training. So therefore, everyone can benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And it's, what, what is the KWU tagline? Uh, what is it? Um, 
one karate or one, you know, there's no politics. It's just one karate, one... Uh, one union or something like that. You no, know, yeah, yeah. So that that's what we're going to try and do. And no politics, no bullshit, just train, just train. And, you know, isn't it great that, oh, Jitsu Kai are going to be on the map with Kyok Shin and they could win. And they don't win because of the grade they are and the belt they wear. They win because they can, they are the best fighter. I'm not saying that people have not fought or won because they're not the best fighter. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the right man or girl deserves to win because of their merits of what they do on the map. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, that's that's the idea with that. It's still early stages of everything because we're only just kind of just coming back. And like I've said to Nacho Bernard, Britain, that I'm only just getting back with my business. Um, and then and now I'm now just about to start the kids' karate classes. And then the idea is to have adult knockdown classes and that will hopefully spur on some maybe because it there's a look with UFC coming out and, and being a big thing and stuff like that. If you if I was to put this is no disrespect to karate, I'm just thinking from a business point of view, running a boxing gym that does jiu-jitsu at my gym as well. If I put karate on, a lot of people go, oh karate. Oh yeah, march up and down doing punching and kicking. Because you're sport with UFC and get people getting knocked out and things like that. And it's and it's people love that. But when you actually start saying to people, oh, you can learn this and learn that and this, that, and that. it's a good basis for, for everything else and these kicks and this and that. Um, it can add to your game with jiu-jitsu or UFC, you know, doing something like getting onto a bigger shows like that. You know, um, I want people to sort of look at the knockdown training at the gym and, you know, do something like get my K1 fighters at the gym and go, right, come and do this knockdown training on the Saturday. We'll do an hour of conditioning. We'll go downstairs with this. We'll do knockdown. Then what we'll do is we'll get the gloves on and we'll do K1. So it's like a bit of a mixture. Then, then we'll, if we we'll then say, I'm going to put a karate class on, hopefully that will then spur on people going, oh, I want a bit of that. That's where you get that axe kick or that spinning kick. Yeah, I want, I want a bit of that. So that's, that's the game plan. That's the idea. And help, you know, Bernard Creighton build the brand here um, and, and the instructors that are here help them uh, build it uh, for him mm-hmm. and us and us so that's that's the idea that's the idea that's the big one and yeah like i'm back mean, in love with crying yeah same here like i mean happened when i came back to with my association when i came into my now oh, yeah. association i'm with ikeo nakamura and then like obviously after i had the judd episode um and all the feedback i got i mean i don't want to make this about me but that's when i had my uh, like the realization i said okay i said i know what i bring and I know that all the guys that I, that I tagged yesterday in that announcement, if you haven't seen it, it's on Instagram, that I have to lead the way because no one's like, I'm not saying no one's doing it. They're doing their own thing. But I said, why don't we just all come together? We've all had each other on each other's shows. We know each other. Let's just come together and become like the NATO of Kyokushin. That's, and that's the goal. Man. That's, love that. Uh, NATO of Kyokushin, I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think what's really nice is, you know, you, you're still able to give, you're still able to, you know, for someone like me, you're able to give back, you're able to give back experiences, you're able to give back, you know, knowledge and things like that. And it's, and it, for, I think, so from your side of things, it's nice because everything's coming together and you're able to create more awareness. I think for, for my side of things as well, it's, you're very, you could be easily forgotten. You know, you, you spend your life doing something and you're easily forgotten. So you come on and do something like this, it's a real honor because you think, oh, Someone gives a shit, you know. Someone, someone wants to hear my story. Someone gives a shit, and they think, oh, that's that's nice. And also as well, if I can lend a bit of perspective on something that another fight or another person that might be going through that as well, saying that I was nervous and scared sometimes of fighting. You know, someone might go, oh, I was like that. You never know. You, someone might go, oh, can I come and train with you? Oh, actually, I think that, or you know, something. So it's it's nice. And like I said, I've listened to a few of your podcasts with a few people. Like I said, Nicholas Petas one last night. It's just really interesting. I was like, oh wow, I could just sit and listen to this all night. It's really interesting. So it's 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 nice to to have this. Um, and I think you know, with today's day and age where we have Zoom and where we have you know, these podcasts and things like that, it's, it can create a bigger uh, audience, but also a bigger family clubbing together. Yeah, no, like especially like I remember when I had Rene Stichter on my show, and people were like, "Who's Rene Stichter?" And then Wesley was like, "Like guys, this guy's like an Ashihara legend. Like this guy." Okay, the so Rene. He's a really good friend of mine. Yeah. And, uh, so they got me to the subject of Rene. Rene is a really good friend of mine. Uh, and we're really close. And he, he 
was the person I was scared of the most in the Everyone world. Everyone was. Everybody was. It's Renault was the Renault was the one. Renault was. I mean, Darren, Darren. I was nervous at Darren. I was thinking, shit, man, this this kid's not going out. Renault was where Darren was coming up through the ranks, and I was maybe one or two tournaments ahead of him in terms of novice that that sort of thing. Um, Renault was already like high profile. Renault was already knocking everyone out. And I remember I'd being injured in 2001. So he got me on a Rene Stickler thing. I, I remember being injured in 2001. And I say this to Rene all the time. I was injured and my coach said, look, come to, Darren was fighting. In fact, Darren fought Rene. Um, I think in the final, I think, semi-final fought Rene. And uh, uh, he said to me, I'll oh, come, come to, come to the tournament in Holland. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm there, I'm coming. And I had an operation on my hands, so I was all sort of bandaged up and that. And I remember going into, I'd seen this guy, Rene, knocking everyone out. And I remember going into the, to the uh, bar and getting this hot dog, coming out. And as I came out, I remember going, <laughs> other, he got, dropped this other guy. And I mean, shit, as I'm doing that, all the ketchup's falling out of the hot dog. And I'm like, shit. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I've got to fight that guy one. He's a lightweight. Oh God. And he beat Darren. Um, and he won the tournament. It was the Oyama Cup, and he won. He won the tournament. And I remember thinking, "Shit!" So in my head, when I came back to England, I was trying to get fit from this operation. I was thinking, "Darren Stringer, but I'm thinking, when I stick, when I stick, when I stick." So equally, you had the catalyst, which was Darren Stringer. Here, you had the Rene Stickler thing. Rene Stickler, and Rene was winning everything. Rene was Rene was winning everything, and I was like, "Wow, I want to be. I want to be this like this guy." Um, and then. We were meant to fight in 2003. I went to the I was in the Yoyama Cup, and he, we were both placed uh, either way we were, we were um, seeded, and we came up into the final. And he unfortunately got an injury, wow. uh, semi final, I think. So he he didn't fight. He withdrew. And I remember, and I remember thinking, I remember th- my coach looking at me, going, "Right, this is all you've spoken about two years. All you've spoken about two years." And I remember shitting myself. I remember thinking. Oh, it's Rene, God. This is, and this is like his tournament. This is like he's won this every year. I'm like, oh, shit. Oh, my God. He doesn't want, he's not going to lose. He doesn't want to lose. No one wants to lose. He's not, he doesn't want to lose. He's in his backyard as well. I was like, oh. And I remember being really nervous. I mean, you're nervous when you first start the tournament. When you few in, your nerves start to go a little bit because you've warmed into it. And then all of a sudden, Rene, my nerves are back up there again. I'm like, oh, God. And I remember him saying to me, how are you going to fight him? And I said, I don't know. We'll go back. And he said, no, 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 you need, you need to move. You need to move. This is what you've got to do. You've got to fight like a... I want you to fight like a semi-contact fight. I was like, okay, why am I doing that? And he said, because Rene is going to stick to you like that. Rene is going to try and punch holes in you. So, like, okay. And he said, Rene is going to punch holes in you, so you need to move. I was like, oh, yeah. So we must have spent about half an hour warming up for Rene. Thinking, you know, I remember walking out, leg, legs like lead, thinking, shit. And then he went like, he just went... Like that and then they went oh, unfortunately when I stick I was like no so I I won the tournament by default but I wanted I didn't want to fight Rene but I wanted to fight Rene because how would I know if I was truly a good fighter mm-hmm. out fighting Rene stick I have to fight Rene Stickler because I will only know then if I'm good enough if I need to go and work on myself or you know I need to I need to know this is the man and we didn't fight but what happened then was what a nice guy he just came up to me, started talking to me, and, and we hit it off. And obviously, when you then when you then go to different tournaments, you then you then meet up. And he was always very he's a he's a gentleman of the sport. I mean, I've been swearing on here. That dude would never swear. He is a gent, he's a real gent. And um, yeah, I've got nothing but love and respect for that guy. Um, and we did fight, we did fight, we fought once, we fought in 2004. And I said to him the other day, I, I, shitty, de- shitty decision when you win on boards. That's just, that's just shit. No fighter wants to win on boards. And I, I think I had maybe one board with him. But, so we were, we were equal. But Rene taught me the biggest lesson in that fight that made me change my style from then on in. And he hurt me really badly, really badly, just before in the second extension. And what he did was he had one pace at one part of the fight. And I, I was relaxing into the fight in the second round. And he changed the tempo of his punching. And 
I don't know. If he, he'd hit me so hard in the stomach, he went oisky gakuski upstairs and then went faster underneath with stuskies. And he absolutely winded me so bad. And I don't know how I got to the end of the round, but if it hit me again or kicked me around the stomach, I would have, I would probably would have stopped. And he, and he, and I knew I was fit and conditioned, but he hurt, he really hurt me. We got to the end of the thing, uh, and I'd, I'd managed to edge it on a board, but it, but really looking back, it was, it made me change the way I thought by tempo change from him. And I remember saying, I've said that to him before. Um, the, the biggest thing of that day was, the lesson that he taught me with, with what, how he hurt me, I thought, shit. And I think if I fought him in 2001, he probably would have beaten me in 2001 because he nearly beat me in 2004. And I was more of an established fighter in 2004. But 2001, if he could do that to me in 2004 and I was more experienced, more established, more, more experienced, then and 2001, he would have beaten me. I, I, I believe, I believe. But yeah, Rene Stickler, legend. Absolutely yeah. legend. Nothing but love for that guy. Absolute Same. legend. Been such a such a nice dude, man. Such a nice uh, dude. He, he's so soft spoken. And I guess we'll uh, conclude it here because you know, obviously, I gotta get, I gotta start work soon. But Darren, That's I cool, want to say, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on. I had a blast just hearing the stories. You're, thank you, you can come on anytime again you want. We could just. Oh, thanks, like, man. Next thanks time, for like, me. hey, what I want to do next time is have you and Darren. Darren squared on that's the new joke. I have Darren squared. And then like, you just give stories, you know, we have the white, we have the, the karate darling and the black sheep. And like, we could just like, it would be like, <laughs> we could, we could do that and just like shoot the shits and whatnot. But where yeah. can people connect with you on social media? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, up, I'm, I'm up for that. And lastly, it's been, it's been lovely doing this. It's been lovely. Uh, someone asking the questions like that and it makes it makes me remember it's reminisce about 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 stuff like that so it's uh, it's nice for me it's nice to do as well so it's, it's it's been an honor to be on your show thank you and uh anytime you want me on let's i'll speak i'm speaking i'm seeing that on friday so i'll um yeah we'll we'll, uh, we'll say listen we need to we need to do that with you soon so that'd be nice and renee maybe get renee on as well because we down to i don't know i thought renee That'd be right. We get the Dutchman on. Then we got the real NATO. We got we the got, flying Dutchman. The flying Dutchman. We got we got NATO and like of Kyokushin in full swing. We got two Brits, a Canadian, and a Dutch. That's like NATO <laughs> collaboration right there, man. So that's, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, let's get one. <laughs> yeah. So what's your platforms people can connect you with you on? Like if they want to. Um, I'm I'm probably more sort of. Um, I thought you use, so, uh, use uh, Instagram more. It's 87 Fitness. Uh, so Darren Chan, uh, 87 Fitness. Um, I'm obviously on Facebook and things like that, but Instagram is probably the one that I hit up the most. So uh, yeah, 87 eight, Fitness. Num the number eight, the number seven Fitness. So yeah, <laughs> I'm up on that and, and cool. Perfect. Perfect. The episode will, guys, the episode will be out soon. Um, when it's out, make sure to like, share, subscribe, share, share, share. And we're going to put on all the platforms. One, Marshall Way, Real Talk, you name it. Just make sure to subscribe to all our pages because we're all doing it. We're all working together now. It's a new era in the Kyokushin online content world. So make sure to hit the like, share, subscribe to the Drew Experience. Make sure to follow Sensei Darren and us to all.